I'm here at the Neumann headquarters in Berlin, Germany with Martin Schneider. So this room, this is our small measurement room that we use for development and for service for measuring all microphones that have come in for service. They're all measured in here to see that they're fit and nicely fulfill all acoustical specifications before we ship them back to the customer. Tell me about how this is then used. Why is this so important when testing microphones? Well, when testing anything, the important thing is you need a suitable test setup. It has to be the same every day, in the morning, in the evening, doesn't have any moods. It always does the same thing. We don't want any interference from the walls. We want to measure microphones in this surrounding here from single directions, so just the direct sound. This loudspeaker will emit sound in all directions, but only the small portion hitting the microphone directly will be recorded by the microphone. There will be no reverb, no reflections coming from the other sides. So we are able to measure the microphone exactly, let's say, if I'm allowed to rotate it, now it's going to look directly on ear. Um, our reference point is the no nose, so let's say zero degree here. The microphone is set on a rotating table, so we can make a polar pattern measurement, slowly rotating it in one degree steps. Mm -hmm. And then see how the microphone reacts to different frequencies coming from different angles. And you can only do that nicely in such an anechoic room, which is also called free field room. Okay. Meaning, in contrast to diffuse field or reverberant field room, it's a free field room. It's, it's like if you're standing out on an open field and there's no trees, no walls, no reflections from nowhere and you shout and it sounds very thin. Yeah. because the sound goes anywhere but doesn't come back because there's no echoes. The idea is to figure out how the microphone responds to frequencies across the spectrum, the frequency response. You can assume that the reflections aren't going to impact the frequency balance, but how do you account for the non-linearities of the frequency response for the speaker, for example? Okay, let's first, I guess, talk about the test signal. One way to do it is with a stepped sign, meaning um, changing the frequency from very low frequencies to very high frequencies in small steps, going do, 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 like on a scale. And the second method, more modern and but slightly less accurate, is with a swept sign going droop continuously and then measuring while the sweep goes on in a very short time span. And we can do both systems in here. And we do that first to measure the loudspeaker because okay we need the loudspeaker as a sound source it's a nice special loudspeaker coaxial system specially built for us and equalized for us by the colleagues who do our monitors mm -hmm. so they know what they're doing um, but it's not absolutely flat it's a big box we need to know exactly what the loudspeaker does so we have to measure the loudspeaker first so that's where a measurement microphone comes into play i've got one measurement microphone here mm -hmm. half inch microphone that we put exactly on this standard, exactly where our microphones to be measured as after our afterwards. So what we first do is we measure the loudspeaker with such a stepped or swept sign. And then we know what the loudspeaker does. Quite simply, what we do then is put our mic to be measured in exactly the same place, repeat the measurement, and then we have two measurements. With the same signal chain, the only difference are these two microphones. If we subtract these measurements from each other on a logarithmic scale, loudspeaker minus loudspeaker is nothing. Loudspeaker drops out of the equation. And so what we keep is the difference between our microphone and the measurement microphone. What the measurement microphone does, we know absolutely. It goes to calibration with the manufacturer regularly, so we know exactly what it does. And it's not perfect either. It's not ruler flat. It has something like a 0.7 dB plus at very high frequencies. We compensate that in our calculations. And they know, then we know exactly what our microphone does. You really need a really good room. The quality of the loudspeaker is not that important. It should be able to produce everything from very low to very high frequencies, but it doesn't have to be ruler flat. But you need a good, good measurement microphone and a calibrated one in order to be able to compensate for the loudspeaker and know exactly what you're doing. Yeah. And this applies for any time you're measuring anything. So it's basically a transfer function measurement, right? Right. You're figuring out what function does the device under test 
have on the signal. Yep. And if you have a reference, this might be sending an electronic signal out and back in to an interface, for example, and you're just measuring your overall system, including the room, the speaker, the microphone. The only thing you need to isolate is the whole system. But in this case, we're not measuring the room, the speaker, we're measuring the microphone only. So it becomes yep. even more important to include the loudspeaker, the room, into your reference, right? So instead of sending an electronic signal out of your interface back in, like you might do for a live sound system tuning, now we need to send the reference signal out of the interface through the loudspeaker, through the measurement microphone, and then back in and subtract all of that yep. from what we get here. Something else that comes to mind when you're testing a microphone especially is comb filtering. You don't want some reflection to meet with the direct sound at a slight delay yep. and cause this summation and cancellation of frequencies throughout the spectrum. Yep. You want a nice linear response. Yeah, that's already where one might say this is not an ideal setup. Because you can see there's a stand here, there's a rotating table, there's a horizontal bar. These are already tiny reflectors influencing our measurements. We have this nice absorptive room, but we've got to hold the microphone somehow. So we have to put in some reflectors here. And when we do some measurements, get some nice curves, then there will be always some slight wobbliness there. Where one can look at it and see, okay, at which frequencies are they? To which wavelength does this correspond? Talking about comb filters, okay, there's this direct sound hitting the left ear and there's a tiny reflection coming from down there. Let's say half a meter longer perhaps corresponds to a certain half wavelength, corresponds to this tiny dip in the frequency response. Yep. So that's where when you do microphone measurements, it's not even in such a room, it's not absolutely trivial. It's absolutely helpful to have such a room. But even here, when you're talking about these tiny discrepancies and the curves and you want to analyze them you have to think about okay which are, what are the small systematic errors i do with the setup here and okay this dip comes from measurement setup and not from the microphone yep it sounds like a skill set you're, you're a microphone developer so clearly right. you need to have that why is there a non-linearity here? Oh, that corresponds with this reflection that I know is there. But that's also for someone who's interested in acoustics. If you're in a room and you see a big dip, knowing these wavelengths and how the difference between the direct sound and reflected sound correlate to a specific frequency can help you understand, oh, there's a non-linearity in my room at this frequency. Well, what surface and what offset corresponds to that and maybe that's where you should focus your attention so always think about just as kyle said wavelengths frequencies okay geometry all right we've got a culprit here we'll put that out and then everything improves possibly what are some of the limitations we're still in the physical mm. world yeah um, limitations i mean i called it the small room beforehand because it works down nicely down to a certain frequency it's a nice practical room and it fit into, into the building but when you really want to measure down to 20 hertz things become difficult because then you have 17 meters wavelength the wedges would all have to be something like four meters long in all directions would not fit into this room that's when you need larger rooms going down to this frequency or find alternative ways to measure and there are some setups which we have and which we use where we can measure in the absolute perfect free field plane wave situation down to 10 hertz corresponding to 34 meters or 100 feet and to get really clean measurements from our microphones there that's the curves that we use in combination with all the measurements from the other rooms to write our data sheet the standard says it should be plane wave here we're at a bit more than one meter we're sort of still in the circular wave this is what i call the midfield this is not according to the absolute rule of the standard the standard would say infinity distance. Okay, infinity is a bit difficult, difficult to realize. <laughs> Realistically speaking, it would be something like eight meters, which is larger than the length of this room. But for us, this is not the room to write our data sheet curves in, but to do our standard measurements for development for, for service. I think for the last 50 years roundabout, we've all be, always been measuring at this identical distance. So even those different rooms might have been different anechoic chambers. All the measurements of all the microphones have been done at a similar distance. 
yielding the same bit of proximity effect we have at this distance already. Always calibrated with the same microphone in the same room at the same distance. So all the microphone measurements we do in here are all comparable. Relative to each other, they stay constant. For the absolute curves that we publish, we add some additional curves from other rooms. We will make really perfect measurements down to 10 hertz, but these may take a few hours for a single microphone. Um, so you can't do that with on a daily basis with every single microphone we want to measure. So I guess <laughs> one way you overcome that is with consistency, like you said, mm -hmm. um, of yep. the measurements. But also you just kind of say, well, what is the purpose of this room? Mm -hmm. it, it does a great job for what you're doing here. And then yep. you do go to some other facilities when you need to extend down to 10 hertz, yep. right? Awesome. And a similar room, slightly smaller in size, is what we use also in production. There's many rooms like this in production, but the ones where our microphones are measured is, let's say, two thirds of this size, the size of this room here. In production, it's more automated. There's an automatic arm driving the microphone in here in front of the loudspeaker. The loudspeaker does a sweep, yep. turns the microphone, measures the rear side from the side, then goes out, says, please switch me over to Omni or figure eight drives back in, then says everything intolerance, everything fine. Or red light has to be checked. Every single microphone has to be final to end tested acoustically in such a room, depending on the polar pattern from, might be from different angles or all different polar patterns. And only then it's acoustically fine to be delivered. There's some other final tests before the microphone goes into, into the box and we're completely happy and it's safe for shipping to the customer. I took a, a tour of the facilities, the production facilities uh, at Sennheiser headquarters in Vedemark. And I, I was amazed that how many individuals spend so much time hand building these microphones, testing them with these anechoic chambers like you described. I guess that's what's required when you want to have such a small tolerance between microphones. Mm -hmm. Pretty much any U87 you buy is going to be a U87 sound, as opposed to maybe some other mm -hmm. options, which are mass produced mm -hmm. in China, and there's a much larger tolerance uh, between capsules. You, you know you're gonna get a very, mm -hmm. very tight tolerance when mm -hmm. you buy a Neumann mic. Very important, important part of it is testing, 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 yeah. and also not only the final testing, but also at different steps, let's say when part of the amplifier a PCB might be tested separately and then the whole amplifier is sampled and then the complete amplifier or the whole circuit tested and only then the capsule put on and then tested together with the capsule acoustically and for noise and before that all sorts of mechanical tests. I want to thank you again, you and your whole team. Uh, it's really cool that I've come here and you guys have welcomed me in, shown me this. It's been such an awesome opportunity to finally step foot in one of these rooms. Make sure to watch my discussion with Martin. I'll leave a link to that video in the description below. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Pleasure.